So if you recall, up to this point, we've been covering topics related to the executor service. We talked about the key interfaces that are part of the executor service. We talked about the key methods in the executor service. And now we're going to talk about the thread pool executor, which is a class that implements the executor service, at least indirectly. So as you can see here, the executor service is the interface. And then there's a class that implements that, which is a so-called abstract class. It's not meant to be instantiated. It's just meant to provide some method implementations that are used by other implementations of the executor service interface. And then we have the thread pool executor. The thread pool executor is a class that runs tasks submitted to it using a thread within a pool of threads that are managed by the thread pool executor. And you'll see it's used for a bunch of different things. So uh, several of the built-in thread pools you get through the executor's utility class are implemented by the thread pool executor class. There are other classes, which we will not talk about right now, that also are implementing the executor service interface, but we're going to defer that largely till next semester. This is typically the way things work. You have a thread pool executor instance. It has a pool of threads that's running inside of it. And client programs come along and submit callables, or less likely runnables, by the submit method. And that then gets stuck into a work queue, which is a queue of, of tasks waiting to be run. And then depending on what variant of the implementation is used, based on some flags that are passed in and some parameters that are passed to the thread pool executor constructor, a thread will be, uh, when, when a thread is available, it will pull a request off the work queue and process it in the background. There's a bunch of different ways of changing the behavior of thread pool executor using the constructor, which has a lot of parameters, as you can see here. So we're going to kind of talk through the different parameters that can be passed to thread pool executor and see how that changes the semantics of the class. The first two parameters that are passed to the thread pool executor will control the size of the pool of threads. And there are two parameters here. One is called core pool size. And this is the number of threads to keep in the pool, even if nobody's using them at the moment. So it's kind of like the, the default number, which are always there, the core threads. And then there's also something that's called maximum pool size, which is the maximum number of threads that the pool can grow to as new threads are added. So those are the two main parameters. And you'll see that depending on what the settings are for those things, you get very different semantics, coupled also with some other parameters you can pass in. The next two parameters are keep alive time and time unit. So the keep alive time is the maximum time that threads will wait for new tasks, idle threads will wait for new tasks, before they're terminated, when the number of threads is greater than the core pool size. Remember, we just talked about core pool size and maximum pool size. So under certain situations, new threads will be created above and beyond what's in the core pool size, up to but not exceeding the maximum pool size. And in that case, when there are more threads in the pool than there are threads designated to be part of the core pool size, the keep alive time is the maximum time that threads will stick around when they have nothing else to do. So if the threads are idle because nobody's giving them work at the moment, then they'll stick around in the thread pool for up to whatever you designate the keep alive time to be based on the time unit. And after that point, those excess threads will be terminated so that the thread pool size shrinks back to the core pool size. So the way to think about this might be um, if you go to a supermarket like Publix or Kroger or whatnot, and there's 12 lanes for people to walk through and cash out, at any given point, there may be a big burst of people, so they'll bring some other folks up to work the cash registers, so you have maybe you know, all 12 of them in, in use at some point. And then after the burst of people is done, maybe it's you know, right after work or during lunch or whatever, then after some period of time, those people who are standing around doing nothing at the, the cash registers will go back and do other things in the store, like stock the shelves or do whatever they do when they're not working the cash register. <laughs> 
So that's an example of sort of timing out and having those people go away. Uh, because there's no point in standing around. Now, you probably always want to keep a certain number of cashiers there, like one or two, because otherwise it would be annoying to shoppers if they went up and there was nobody to take their money. But that would be sort of like the core pool size. So keep alive time is the time, and the time unit is the unit, which is something like seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, things like that. The work queue is a really interesting parameter, because there's a bunch of different variants of how to implement this. So it's basically the queue to use to hold tasks before they are actually run. Now, for certain configurations, you'll use a, a blocking queue that's something like linked blocking queue or array blocking queue, where it can grow. Um, but there's other variants that are quite interesting. So one of the models is the cached thread pool. And with the cached thread pool, the type of queue that's passed in, if you say new cached thread pool, the type of queue that's used there is one that's called a synchronous queue. And a synchronous queue really isn't a queue. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing. It's basically a rendezvous point. And what it does is it will block the calling thread, the thread that's invoking submit or execute, until a thread in the pool that's idle can come along and grab that particular element that's being put in the queue, or until there is no idle thread, and so a new thread will have to be created. So cache threads will create new threads if there isn't one already there. It'll never actually get queued in a queue. It just sort of rendezvous point where you drop things off and wait until a new thread is created or an existing thread is recycled. The good thing about the cached approach with direct handoff is it avoids deadlock because you're always going to get a new thread created if there's not one there to run it already. The downside is you create a lot of threads. So if you're not careful and you have a lot of bursty traffic, you can basically end up with thread per request, which was essentially the, the thing we were trying to get away from back in the day when we first talked about the need for thread pools. So there's, as with all these approaches, there's always pros and cons. If you don't expect to have you know, huge amounts of bursty traffic all showing up at the same time, this approach could work well because the threads will stay alive in the pool for a certain amount of time before they get terminated. Another type of, of queue that can be used, another type of blocking queue that can be used is something called an unbounded queue. This is used by the fixed thread pool by default. So if you make a fixed thread pool using the new fixed thread pool method that's defined in the executor's utility class, then under the hood, it'll make you a linked blocking queue. And that just uses a linked list in order to queue up the runnables or callables for processing by threads in the pool. The pros of this is it helps to smooth out bursty requests, much like companies like Amazon or Walmart hiring seasonal workers during the holidays to handle the much larger number of people coming in to, to shop, you can queue things up so that you, have, you don't reject the requests. They may not get processed right away, but they don't get dropped. The downside is you can consume an unlimited amount of memory resources because you'll be queuing these things up in an unbounded way until you run out of memory on the machine, which may take a while, but it, it's possible if, if requests are coming in very, very fast. Yet another type of queue you can use is a so-called bounded queue. This can also be used with a fixed size thread pool. You can, you can use the thread pool executor yourself to create a pool where you give a blocking queue that has a fixed amount of size, like an array blocking queue. And uh, this is not what you get by default if you use the factory methods that are built into the executor's utility class, but you can program it yourself if you feel like it. The good part with this is it limits the amount of resource utilization because, of course, it's not going to be growing without bound. The downside is that it can be hard to tune and may deadlock. You have to figure out what should the right size be for these kinds of things. So those are some of the choices and some of the ways of configuring the thread pool executor. What you should come away with from this discussion is there's many degrees of freedom that you can tweak and twist and adapt to your particular needs. And the, the executor's utility class gives you some options out of the box, but then you can go and define your own options. The final parameter, which is optional in some versions of this, is the thread factory. And that's the factory used when creating a new thread. And the use of a thread factory is to avoid having to 
hardwire the thread that's created by the thread pool. Instead, you can define your own thread factory if you don't like the one that comes out of the box, the default thread factory. You can define your own thread factory in order to be able to have special properties, special characteristics on the threads that you create. You might want to give them special, uh, special priorities. You might want to make them daemon threads. You might want to subclass them to give them a special name and so on and so forth. So the thread factory can give you a way of being able to let the framework create the threads, but the threads that are created are the ones that you designate. So that's the overview of Threadpool Executor. We will come back later in the course and we'll talk more about these mechanisms and, and how they're used. It's, it's really quite interesting and really quite cool. You don't have to know all the details in order to use the executor's factory methods like new fixed thread pool and new cache thread pool and so on. But uh, this will give you an idea of what's going on underneath the hood.